I'm joined by John Smithson, producer of Sherpa, the documentary. John, welcome to the podcast on jasonsolomons.com. Thank you. Uh, congratulations on your movie as well, which is completely beautiful. I have to say, some documentaries, you, you, you know, perhaps you don't need to see them on the, on the big screen, but this one absolutely, because from the very first shot, the swirling mists and mountains and currents of Everest take you by surprise. I think. Yeah, we had a brilliant crew up there, and some of the images they brought back are breathtaking. And, you know, that... I'd, if you go to Everest, you, there is an expectation you're going to get breathtaking images. And that combination, albeit with the terrible, tragic story we told, is is something that somehow works on a big screen. A lot of documentaries don't work on the big screen, but this seems to, to, to work on the big screen, or that's what people say. Now, you say you went there and, and told a, a, a terrible tragedy. That's not what you went there, it's not what you set out to do, is it? You set out to tell the stories of the Sherpas, this, this terrible tragedy that befalls 16 of them. That That just happened while you were there. Yeah, what we wanted to do, we thought the story of the Sherpas was an untold story. People just don't realise what they do or just think they're just like porters or cooks or like assistants that help people get to the summit. It's much more fundamental than that. You know, they regard it as their mountain for all sorts of cultural and spiritual reasons. They enable anyone else to climb Everest. Literally, they fix ropes all the way to the top. So nowadays, an averagely fit, healthy, acclimatised person can get to the top. But what, but, could I get there? Uh, um, looking at you, I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <That geez. laughs> and, uh, I think you could if you wanted to train. Yeah, just like people can run a marathon. Yeah. And um, uh, But that was a story that hadn't been told. So... We wanted to look at that. And then, like the previous year, in 2013, there'd been this nasty fisticuffs on the mountain between some European climbers and some Sherpas, which ended up with the Sherpas actually hitting uh, one of the climbers and one of the climbers using a word you probably don't want me to use to describe the Sherpas. So, well, uh, uh, amazing. You, you actually have that footage, though. Yeah. I mean, extraordinary that that was caught. Cool. I mean, yes, it was. It was. Well, everyone's got cameras on Everest yeah. these days. Uh, that everyone has cameras on Everest. So we thought, why on earth is there now fisticuffs on the mountain when once upon a time you associate Everest with that amazing time when, you know, when it was conquered in 1953 and smiley Sherpa Tenzing was there mm -hmm. and these were these lovely smiley people who just got us to the top of Everest. So what had gone wrong with the relationship? So we went back to the mountain with this incredibly talented Aussie director called Jen Pedham and her team in 2014, not knowing what we were going to get. Because on Everest, you have no idea. You can, you, anything can happen there, uh, from heroism to tragedy. Right. Uh, what we never, ever imagined in our worst sort of scenario was what did happen was on that day in mid-April where the Sherpas have to go through this horrible place called the Ice Fall, which is just a geological feature which is dangerous because ice can fall. That's why it's called an ice fall. And there's the it's risk like a of... a waterfall of ice, isn't it? It's like because a waterfall of ice. Moving. Avalanches can fall on it and there's crevasses and it's a dangerous, ugly horrible place to be but you if you want to climb Everest from that side you've got to go through it the Sherpas were going through it when an avalanche occurred killing 16 people which was the worst disaster that had ever occurred in Everest 16 people within the space of an avalanche in just a few minutes and we're talking about a small community a very close-knit community this must have decimated well it's literally double decimated the community we see the tears we see the the, the closeness of the, the, and the families dependent on these sherpas for their livelihood yes, and their existence uh, and they all seem to have family who've lost people who have died in Everest. you know being a sherpa is one of the world's most dangerous jobs you know it's it's more dangerous than being an american soldier in iraq when they used to be there it's more dangerous than being an alaskan crab fishermen this is a dangerous job and they do it obviously to earn money for their families and they do it so we the westerners who can afford hopefully to get a guide to take us to the top of the mountain so it was a tragic event which is devastating for the community uh, we couldn't therefore make the film we were supposed to make following two Sherpas to the very top of the mountain because there was no more climbing on the mountain. Instead, what happened was this amazing clash of the cultures because in the emotional aftershock of this dreadful avalanche, that quickly morphed into tension, anger, resentment about their conditions, the risks the Sherpas take. And they took matters into their own hands and didn't want any more climbing that year. They effectively took control of their mountain and said, we don't want you to climb it. So that enabled us, that gave us a story 
that really put in sharp relief the different perspectives between us Westerners who go there to climb it and the Sherpas for whom this is a mountain of religious and spiritual importance. Uh, and also of industrial importance as well, because it, this this event seems, from, from your documentary, to, to have unionised them in some way, given them some conditions, something that perhaps isn't there in, 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 like laid down in law. It's always been, I suppose, a very sort of ad hoc arrangement that you, you, you give your Sherpas some money and, and off you go. But now that, now that looks like it can't happen anymore. Yeah, one of the reviews I saw said this is the best film you'll ever see about an industrial dispute. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't sure if that was a line that was going to put people off or attract them. But it is true because what you're seeing is an industrial dispute, but of a most remarkable type because 16 of their members had just died Mm. and they are doing this incredibly dangerous job. Their compensation was scandalous. What happens? The insurance payment they got, even having the money enough to properly bury the dead uh, Sherpas. It was all somewhat scandalous and It was. Their anger turned into doing something about it. And, you know, there is the possibility that some good has come from that, that when climbing resumes on the mountain, which it's scheduled to do in March and April of 2016, that the conditions, the working conditions uh, for the Sherpas will be significantly better. Uh, John, you've done this sort of thing before. You've got form uh, and probably the right out, the right clothing, therefore, because uh, you did Touching the Void with, with Kevin McDonald, of what a brilliant mountaineering documentary. But you also did uh, with Danny Boyle, 127 hours or 127 hours. What is it about these extremes that attract you? You seem very sort of quite a placid, but excitable fellow. But, you know, what, what is it that, about these kind of, uh, I, I suppose, extremities that, that attract you as a filmmaker? Um, extremes is the word because you're seeing humans at the extreme of their performance. Uh, They're out of their comfort zone, sometimes physically and mentally. You're seeing, you know, what could be higher jeopardy than climbing Mount Everest? What could be higher jeopardy than with the drama that was unfolding on that mountain in this film Sherpa that we just made? What could be more higher jeopardy than what happened to Joe Simpson in that film Touching the Void that listeners may remember when Joe, the rope was cut and he was fell into a crevasse and given up for dead and in this most astonishing act of survival, somehow crawled out and got back to safety. Or Aaron Ralston, the guy in 127 Hours, trapped in, under, a can, in, under a boulder in a canyon in Utah, in the, absolutely in the middle of nowhere, unable to escape. No one would ever find him, and he had to cut off his own arm in order to free himself from the boulder to survive. But these are just incredible stories of human nature at the extremes. And at the end of the day, I'm not an extreme I don't take part in extreme sports, maybe do a bit of skiing, but I don't take part in extreme sports unless you count cycling in London an extreme sport, which sometimes it feels that way. And there's something about these stories that I find particularly fascinating because at the end of the day, it's about the power of the story. And all three of these films, 127 Hours, Touching the Void and Now Sherpa, have an astonishingly powerful um, story at their core. Well, it's, it's a wonderful trilogy. Thank you very much for coming on to talk about it. And best of luck with Sherpa. It is absolutely beautiful and also very important as well. It kind of, you know, it, it kind of, it kind of took my, my my Ken Loach aspect, my kind of social aspect, and then with the, with the beauty of, of cinematic nature as well. So, congratulations on that, and thanks for coming on the show, Thank John. Thank you very much.